It's a good time. Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, December 13th, and we are going to discuss The Fablemans, um, a story about and directed by Steven Spielberg. Yeah, I, so I, I, um, there's a lot to talk about here. I would say that this is a fairly complicated text. Uh, you know, we talk about movies as, as texts, and a lot happens in uh, the two hours and 20 minutes in, the, in this movie. Right. So uh, so I'm, I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about as we go on. It is uh, based on Spielberg's own life. Um, you know, names are changed. Um, so uh, instead of uh, being Spielberg's, they're Fablemans, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of cute. Of course, I mean, Spiel in, in Yiddish uh, is a tale. Right, and a fable is also a tale, so uh, uh, so one might suggest that that somebody with the name of uh, Spielberg is destined to be a storyteller, uh, no matter what he might have intended for his life. Right, so um, so that's uh, uh, you know, and Berg, of course, in German is a mountain. So uh, so not only a storyteller, but a uh, uh, a very successful storyteller. Uh, you know, you look at uh, Steven Spielberg's career and was nominated for uh, um, uh, he's had seven Oscar nominate. No, I think more than that. 23 Oscar nominations in his career. Right. Um, uh, if you look at the movies that he's made that he was not nominated for an Oscar, uh, many filmmakers would be very proud to have any of those movies on their resume. Right, uh, movies like uh, Jaws, for example, or um, uh, Empire of the Sun, which happens to be one of my favorite oh. uh, little watched uh, Steven Spielberg movies. Um, but uh, the Indiana Jones movies, uh, um, Minority Report, a science fiction movie, Catch Me If You Can, The Terminal, I mean, the War of the Worlds. I mean, these are the movies that didn't get nominated for best director or best picture, but um, but the list of his movies that have been nominated, uh, either for director or best picture or both, you know, include the remake of West Side Story, uh, which came out the same year as The Fablemans. Which um, think about the the uh, not just the artistry that it takes, but but actually the the drive to uh, you know, create and release uh, two movies in the same year. Uh, pretty remarkable. The Post in 2018, Bridge of Spies in 2016, Lincoln in 2013, War Horse in 2012. Uh, he produced uh, the movie Letters for Iwo Jima um, in um, 2007. Munich, which is one we have not watched for our real Jewish classics, but maybe should be on the next list. Um, Saving Private Ryan, a Schindler's List, which we did watch, uh, of course, um, and Saving Private Ryan in 99, Schindler's List in 94, both uh, nominated for Best Director and uh, he won the Oscar for both of those. The Color Purple in 1986, E.T. in 1983, Close Encounters going back to 1978. Uh, right? So, um, so a, a pretty extraordinary list of movies in Steven Spielberg's life. This particular movie was nominated for seven Oscars, uh, including uh, Best Picture, Best Director, uh, Musical Score, John Williams, who uh, has scored uh, many of, uh, of uh, Spielberg's movies uh, and many others as well, and has, uh, I don't know, probably 50 Oscar nominations, something like that. Uh, I was also nominated for Best Actress for Michelle Williams, uh, Best Supporting Actor for uh, the small part that Judd Hirsch plays in the movie, and Best Screenplay and Best Production Design. So, uh, so, so pretty uh, remarkable uh, uh, career as a, a director, right? And uh, a producer, um, and. Uh, but fairly rare for him to be 
co-credited as a writer as he is on this movie. Of course, this movie is, is uh, I guess, as personal, if not more personal than anything he's ever made. Although some of his uh, life story, I think, sort of creeps into uh, uh, movies that, that he made over the years in, in other kinds of ways, in movies like E.T., I mean, stories of, of families with one one parent homes, um, you know, that that his early movies are all uh, have one parent homes, um, seems like. So 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 his biography creeps in in interesting ways and in other movies, maybe just attracted to certain kind of stories uh, because of uh, his background. But but it is rare for him to have a screen credit. In this case, uh, he's credited along with Tony Kushner, um, who is perhaps best known still for the Pulitzer Prize that he won for Angels in America, uh, extraordinary play on, on Broadway. Um, uh, he was born in 1956 in New York City. Spielberg was born, I think, in 1946. Um, and... Uh, um, so and Kushner and Spielberg have worked together on several films going back as far as Munich, I think was the first one that they worked on together in 2006. Uh, but he was also the uh, uh, screenwriter for Lincoln. Uh, both Munich and Lincoln were nominated for the Oscar for uh, best screenplay. He actually worked on the reworked book of West Side Story, which I, I thought was very, uh, very successful rewriting of that book in uh 2022 so this is uh i think just his fourth collaboration with spielberg but um but they they've all been pretty extraordinary and i think this is a, a very good screenplay uh that we're looking at here um you know we're telling a, a story of several years in in two and a half hours uh it's it's uh, it it starts as kind of a pastiche of memories right and and there are other movies that that might serve as models for that uh, movies like amarcord by fellini who made a movie about his childhood and it's kind of a, a series of sort of scenes from his childhood if you like or uh or woody allen did it with the movie radio days right sort of scenes from his childhood sort of strung together but uh as the as this movie goes on you realize that it, it is more than just sort of reminiscences and scenes it's actually a very intricately plotted and connected uh um line from beginning to end uh and uh it also puts me in mind of uh a movie like um uh citizen kane in a strange way that it's uh it it's a, a biography uh in a sense but also that the final scene uh, is sort of a key to understanding everything that you've seen before it in this in this movie, uh, and perhaps it's a key to understanding all of Spielberg's movies and his success. Right, the the final uh, scene where he gets to spend a few minutes with John Ford, right, uh, the the director with the eye patch at the end. I forgot to look up who plays him in the movie, but uh, David Lynch. David Lynch, the uh, director, right? So, right. This is this is John Ford. Uh huh. And there's David Lynch. Right. So David Lynch is perhaps best known for uh, the TV series Twin Peaks, but he also made a, a a variety of interesting and idiosyncratic smaller movies over the years. Certainly, never has achieved the kind of success of a Spielberg, uh, and certainly doesn't work as diligently or as quickly as Spielberg, um, but has made some movies that, uh, you know, that are, are uh, beautiful. And, uh, you know, he made the, the film version of uh, The Elephant Man um, and uh, a few others, uh, Wild at Heart and Blue Velvet and uh, um, a, a couple of others that are, are pretty well known. But so, uh, so he plays the, this, uh, role that uh, you can't call it pivotal in the film because it's the end of the film. But uh, when he explains this notion of horizon uh, to uh, and, and you realize uh, and now having watched the movie again, you realize, 
that there is never a scene in this movie where the horizon is in the middle of the scene, right? And, and uh, um, perhaps the the Japanese block print behind Vanessa's head, um, you know, makes me think about this too, right? That that there is a kind of convention in Western art. Uh, I is this the golden mean? Is that what they call it? The golden ratio, something like that, in landscape painting where the point of disappearance is always in the center, in the middle, right, of, of a painting, right? But Eastern art, like, like the block prints uh, and just Japanese art in general, um, the, the disappearing point is sometimes to the side, it's sometimes up above, it's sometimes down below. Uh, it's rarely, if ever, in the middle of the scene, right? And um, so John Ford's theory of filmmaking is that when the the when the landscape is at the top or the landscape is at the bottom it's interesting and when it's in the middle it's boring okay and um and you realize if you watch this movie that every shot even the most the simplest shots i i i, I wish i could show you some now there's a, a scene uh, where the camera looks up at uh, young Sammy uh, Fableman, um, teenage Sammy Fableman, and his head is positioned in the corner of the room with just two walls, right, on either side of him, and his head in the middle of the, uh, uh, the, the right angle of the wall. And it's a beautiful composition that um, comes from an unusual angle, right? And it's, it's purely and simply the angle itself makes that shot interesting right and the the whole movie is is made that way there there are no uh or rarely shots that are just sort of uh some directors just put a camera on the scene and um you know everything is just square it's right there um uh, spielberg's camera is uh always at an angle uh it does a lot of moving uh, I love there. There's a lot of shots in this movie of the camera showing the camera, right? Uh, and also, like uh, Fellini has made movies about making movies, and other directors have uh, successfully made movies about making movies. Um, the the grown Spielberg's camera is constantly moving around the camera of the young Spielberg, the young Fableman making the movies that Spielberg made when he was a kid, right? So if you actually look up uh, Steven Spielberg's uh, uh, filmography, it starts with these uh, his Western and his World War II movie that he made uh, when he was a kid, when he was in Boy Scouts, right? The ones that, uh, no, no I, th I think at least one of them, it says uh, the, the films themselves no longer exist, right? So it's totally in Spielberg's own mind um, what they actually looked like, how good they might have been or not. Uh, um, but th this movie, I think, does a really great job of showing, uh, um, you know, how a, a young filmmaker starts out making movies. Because, uh, uh, you know, my undergraduate degree is in, in radio, television and film. Uh, it was something I enjoyed even when I was a kid. I mean, I, I made movies with friends when we were in elementary school using my father's Super 8 camera. Um, I had uh, the the film editor, the first one that he has where you uh, uh, cut and splice the film and glue it together. Uh, hmm. I, I had one of those. Um, I, the, the one that he has where he can actually see on screen and go back and forth. I got one of those later when I was in high school, um, you know, uh, convinced my father that we really needed that for our home movies and, uh, you know, and used it for my own amusement. Um, so I, I would say that uh, uh, the similarities to Spielberg don't go any farther than that for me, um, you know, uh, but I, I suspect that both of us remember our first films as being better than they actually were. But I, I I don't I know I can say that about me. I'm not sure I can say that about him. But um, you know, um 
so uh so but but there there are things in this movie that really remind me uh there there's one scene where you see uh he's cut up the scenes and he's got them uh uh with masking tape and he's writing on them what they are right i i mean that's how it was done right i i remember doing that with things um the movie that gets him started in his life apparently i mean i mean, I, I don't know if uh it uh if this is part literary construct or uh, whether it, it, it's, um, you know, true to his life. But the, the the movie opens with his parents taking him to what is apparently his first movie in a movie theater and, uh, and trying to explain to him why it, it won't be scary, even though the room is dark and all those things. Uh, and then as, as many parents have had the movie that they take him to turns out to be a little more grown up than they thought it was going to be. You know, the greatest show on earth is the movie they take him to, which is, uh, I, and this is why I think it might be apocryphal is uh, by, by film, uh, uh, you know, film student, film maven standards, the worst movie to ever win the best picture Oscar is the greatest show on earth. Right. So it's that movie. So of all the movies that have ever won an Oscar for Best Picture, that's the one that people point to and say, ah, "That's that's ridiculous that that movie won." I mean, it's uh, um, you know, it's it's not unusual to for especially for film buffs to say that the best movie of any given year isn't the one that won the Oscar because that's all you know political and show business and all that kind of stuff, and that there's often the kind of smaller, more offbeat movie that. Uh, film critics and film lovers might prefer but um it's um uh you know the the most egregious example that people will point to is this particular movie but but it, it is interesting that the train wreck scene in that is the thing that inspires him to become a filmmaker and to uh become both uh, the storyteller and the one who controls the story which I think is a very powerful motivator in his life. And, uh, um, and to this movie in some ways is, is about uh, coming to terms with that in your life, right? That the stories aren't as neat as you expect. And the camera actually catches things that you didn't, even when you're a great director and all these things are planned, the camera still catches things that you didn't know were there until you look at them afterwards um and uh that there's a certain kind of alchemy that comes in filmmaking uh between the director and the writer and the performer and the editor uh the unsung hero of spielberg's career is his uh editor i i um who uh has worked with him for many many years i think it's thelma thelma schoolmaker i think is her name um um, the internet does say that he went to go see the greatest show on earth. He thought he was going to see a circus. Yeah. And of course, the um, it's a frightening movie. I don't. I'm sure you know his parents didn't realize what they were taking. Right. But, him. You know, look, it, it happens. I mean, I I took the you know a few years ago, I, my kids were all grown, and we took them to a movie that was oh my god, I can't believe we went to this movie together. You know, so. <laughs> Uh, you know, they were grown ups, and I was embarrassed. You know, so uh, <laughs> his, you know, but, his, but it certainly happens is when they're kids too. Yeah, his editor is Sarah Brochar and Michael Kahn. Okay, okay, Schoolmaker must be the one who works with uh, Scorsese, actually. But, um, but uh, you know, a, a lot of movie making is in the editing, and and editors are sort of unsung heroes in general. Uh, Spielberg, I mean, we see it in this movie. I mean, I mean, uh, he has a kind of a natural talent for it. Um, it's you know, but but uh, but that makes it seem too easy. I mean, it, it, you know, he's also uh, like uh, uh, like someone like uh, Tarantino. He's so influenced. He's absorbed all of the movie making craft into his mind and has all of these ideas and skills at his uh uh command you know so uh but his movies uh are really 
it, it's partly planning and it's partly intuition, you know, it's, uh, uh, and that's part of the art. I mean, as it is with any artist who picks up uh, a pen or a paintbrush or whatever, right. Is, is that it's, uh, uh, partly what you've learned, what you've absorbed from others, what you bring that's uniquely you. And there's some kind of alchemy that comes together and, uh, uh and creates, right. So, uh, so pretty powerful stuff. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, we, we've talked uh, a few times now about how rare it is to have Jews play Jews in the movies and the main characters in this movie, uh, the parents, uh, neither of them is a Jewish actor or actress. So Michelle Williams, who was born in 1980, uh, in a relatively brief career, I mean, really, I mean, she's had five Oscar nominations already, uh, starting with, I think her first nomination was for Brokeback Mountain, which was in the Best Supporting Actress category mm -hmm. uh, in 2005. She was also nominated for Best Supporting Actress for Manchester by the Sea in 2016. Uh -huh. And she's been nominated for Best Actress for a movie called Blue Valentine, uh, for playing Marilyn Monroe in My Week with Marilyn, uh, and for this movie, The Fablements. So uh, she hasn't won one yet, uh, but um, I'd, I'd be a surprise if she doesn't at some point. She has won an Emmy for... Uh, um, her for appearing as Gwen Verdon in oh. a mini series about uh, Bob Fosse and Gwen Verdon a few years ago, and uh, she won a Tony. Uh, won it? I think she was nominated for a Tony uh, for a, a appearance on Broadway in a show called Blackbird several years ago. Um, so, very accomplished uh, uh, actress. Uh, we'll see. Uh, if she gets that Oscar winning role one of these days. Um, so Paul Dano, who uh, appears as the dad, Bert. Um, uh, so Mitzi and Bert, Spielberg's real parents' names are Leah and Arnold. But uh, so Mitzi and Bert, uh, he, he's been in a few things over the years. He probably got noticed most, uh, you know, so his breakthrough role was as the older brother in the movie, the comedy Little Miss Sunshine. Uh, a few years ago. Um, uh, he plays identical twins in the movie There Will Be Blood. Um, and uh, uh, he had a role in 12 Years a Slave, which of course won the the Oscar for Best Picture a few years ago. He plays the young Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys in the movie Love and Money, uh, Love and Mercy uh, several years ago as well. So um so neither of them are Jewish. The Jews in the cast, uh, the the main ones, uh, the the young, uh, well the the teenage version of Steven Spielberg is played by Gabriel Labelle, uh, who uh, comes from a Jewish family. He grew up in uh, Vancouver, Canada. So, but uh, this is by far his biggest role. So he's a regular on a TV series which I haven't watched. Uh, since this movie came out, a uh, uh, TV series version of the old Richard Gere movie, American Gigolo. I don't, he's not playing the main role. I'm not sure what uh, what his part is in that. Uh, of course, Judd Hirsch is in this movie in one scene, uh, a memorable one, and was nominated for uh, Best Supporting Actor in this movie. Um, that was his second nomination for uh, Best Supporting Actor. Uh, I think he has the distinction of having nominations the farthest apart of any actor. He was nominated in 1980 uh, for his role as the therapist in uh, Ordinary People. Uh, best known, of course, perhaps for his Emmy-winning role as uh, Alex, the cab driver in the TV series uh, Taxi. Um, but we saw him, if you remember back a uh, number of, uh, you know, episodes of... Uh, Real Jewish classics. We saw him in the Sidney Lumet movie *Running on Empty*, uh, where he plays a '60s radical on the on the run uh, and uh, hiding out under assumed names uh, with River Phoenix playing his son. Um, so uh, a fine movie. Uh, he's been in other uh, good, memorable roles uh, in a science fiction movie called *Independence Day*. He plays the 
uh, the father of the character uh, played by, um, oh gosh, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, ugh, I can. Yeah, but we can probably all I'll see. I'll get it. I'll get it. Yeah. Uh, the Jewish uh, gold, uh, gold something. <laughs> so. Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum. Great. Thank you very much. You know. Yeah. So he plays Jeff Goldblum's uh, father in that. He's got a role in A Beautiful Mind. More recently, he uh, he has a small role in a movie called Uncut Gems. Uh, you know, so uh, great character actor. He was born in New York in 1935. So, uh, so he's also one of the oldest actors to get an Oscar nomination. Uh, so uh, a nice thing. Uh, the other Jewish actor in this that, that I can tell for sure, I'm not sure about some of the kid actors and the, the, their biographies don't always include that kind of stuff. Uh, but um, Seth Rogen, of course, playing Benny is a Jewish actor uh, who also grew up in Canada, like uh, Gabriel LaBelle. Uh, he went to the uh, Talmud Torah Elementary School. Vanessa, if you didn't know that. In, uh, Van Did Poole. not. And uh, he also spent his summers at Camp Miriam, which is a Habanim drawer camp in Oh, Canada. Habanim. That, well, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it does, actually, in a lot of ways. Uh, but so uh, uh, he actually uh, used to do stand-up comedy at camp talent shows, uh, where I'm sure his his camper friends thought he was very funny. And, um, and in a funniest person in Vancouver contest, he came in second. I'm not sure who beat him, uh, but after uh, after that, he moved to Los Angeles to try his career in Hollywood. And he met uh, um, uh, um, uh, a Jewish producer there and ended up in the TV series uh, Freaks and Geeks and uh, then had a featured role in the movie The 40-Year-Old Virgin and then became the uh, star of the next movie, uh, Knocked Up. Right? And he uh, also wrote and appeared in the movie Super Bad and a few other uh, co popular comedies uh, uh, of the last twenty years or so. Um, and uh, probably his most explicitly Jewish role, other than this one, is uh, a movie called An American Pickle, where he's a uh, Lower East Side pickle merchant from the early part of the twentieth century who. Uh, something like Rip Van Winkle falls into the pickle juice and is somehow preserved until mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, present day, right? And so he wakes up in kind of present day New York and becomes uh, uh, starts to pick up uh, where he left off as a pickle baron. So it's, uh, you know, maybe what, that'll appear on our list one of these days as well. So... Um, so uh, a really, uh, you know, well-chosen cast, I think. So that, you know, some of the, the, the actresses who play the sisters, Keely uh, Karsten and Julia Butters, I, I don't actually know much about their uh, religious backgrounds. Um, but uh, so even the uh, director of uh, Spielberg's uh, uh, status I mean, not that he necessarily wanted jewish actors and actresses to play the parts of his parents uh, but even here he didn't do that right so uh so that's that remains sort of an object of fascination for me about the this sort of the rarity of jews uh being allowed to play jews on screen so well uh, the um his his grandma, I yeah. think. Um, Jeannie Berlin is Elaine May's daughter. Right, right. So, um, so. And they're Jewish. Are you sure? Um, yeah. Well, I went down a rabbit hole, but I'll, <laughs> I'll go back. I, I know her dad is Mike Nichols. Oh, maybe. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure about uh, uh, Elaine May, but maybe I. I just don't know. Yeah. So, uh, 
but at any rate, uh, I mean, it's a, still it's, this is this is not an uncommon pattern, right? That uh, uh, Jewish actors may be cast in the Jewish parts in sort of minor parts uh, or, or supporting parts, like Judd, Judd Hirsch or Shelley Winters in Diary of Anne Frank, um, you know, and Lou Jacoby in the same movie. But the the uh, the major roles often go to the starring roles often go to uh, uh, non-Jews. Um, so it's uh, an interesting phenomenon that, that is sort of uh, perhaps a, a, it, it cuts sort of two ways, right? I mean, it's uh, Jews making movies who say Jews are just like everybody else. I don't have to cast a Jew to play a Jewish part, right? Um, you know, and because that's something we want. We want to be recognized as just like everybody else. Uh, and then there's also uh, sort of uh, the, this, uh, you know, the Jewish actors, with some exceptions, are not necessarily bankable, right? And uh, you want people in your movies that are going to ensure that your movie makes some money. Right? So Elaine May is Jewish. She yeah. is. Okay, great. Her, so, maiden name, her maiden name is Berlin. Which is why Jeannie Berlin took it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, um, so, you know, so the, this is, uh, this movie touches on anti-Semitism, of course. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, not really deliberate on our part that we picked this one to be the movie we watched during Hanukkah. But of course, it pretty much opens with Hanukkah after the scene of taking him to the movies, it's, uh, you know, what do you want for Hanukkah? And, uh, uh, you know, the train that he gets sort of car by car each night. So uh, we get kind of a depiction uh, of Hanukkah. We have them saying the Hanukkah blessings. So a nice, uh, uh, you know, I should take credit for it. We deliberately chose this movie to be the movie that we watched during Hanukkah because because uh, it shows Hanukkah on screen, as did, uh, remember, uh, Diary of Anne Frank a couple of weeks ago. So, um, so but uh, so there there's a kind of a, there's some explicit Jewishness throughout this thing. There's no scene of a bar mitzvah. So, mm -hmm. you know, watch this boy sort of through his life experience and that doesn't seem to have played a part uh at least not important enough to make it into uh into this uh plus it portrays his experience of life in uh california as living in a neighborhood without any jews in it other than him um you know which which is perhaps a little surprising anywhere in california um so th there were certainly enough jews around wherever he was to have a synagogue probably but um, but it doesn't seem to play much uh, much of a role. Uh, there's no rabbi character in this movie, uh, as we've seen in, in several other movies uh, uh, in this go round. So the Jewishness all comes from the home. We do see even even in the the later scenes when he's apparently uh, staying in an apartment with his father after his parents split, and he's uh, going to get his first job. Uh, he does, I think, actually get his first job with the producer of Hogan's Heroes. Uh, that's that's certainly one of his early uh, show business credits, you know. Um, but but even in that scene, we see a Hanukkah menorah on the uh, credenza in the apartment. So uh, uh, none of these characters sort of leave their Jewishness behind. Uh, they're they're they all remain Jewish, um, you know. Even in, in the scenes with the uh, non-Jewish girlfriend, I mean, there there's not a kind of an explicit, uh, uh, you know, any sort of disavowal vowel of his Jewishness. I I, I do like the line, uh, you know, it, when he had gives her a cross at prom and she asks him if he's found Jesus, and he says in a jewelry store, you know, <laughs> right? So, um, so you know, he he remains pretty true to it himself and to his faith, um, you know, throughout, which uh, seems to be uh, a, a part of Spielberg's uh, life as well. That's the reason he made Schindler's List. Uh, he's, he's 
invested a, a significant amount of his personal uh, tzedakah in documenting the Holocaust and uh, a very large interview project with, with Holocaust survivors. Uh, so, uh, uh, so he's uh, in, in, you know, while we might not say uh, everything about Steven Spielberg is something that we would want our children to emulate, uh, there is quite a bit in his life that we could say confidently uh, uh, that uh, we wish our kids could do some of the the good that he's done for the Jewish community over the years. Right? So, um, what else? Um, uh, so, um, um, so I went down a, a rabbit hole with a couple of things. Um, this is, um, Leah um, Spielberg, um, and I thought Michelle Williams, I mean, it looks just like her. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. and, um, there. A movie, in a movie sort of way. Yeah. Right. I, right. Of course. 72. Uh, right. <laughs> Michelle, Michelle Williams is much prettier. Um, but they have. Um, this restaurant that she and Bernie opened is kosher. Yeah. And this is on the website. You know, there's pictures of her. There's not, I don't see any pictures of Bernie, so to speak. Um, yeah. And uh, so, and uh, Spielberg is launching a project to document unspeakable barbarity of October 7th. Oh, interesting. Oh. That's that's great. It just came out this week. Yeah. 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 So I I seem to remember that his mom was in the was involved with a restaurant years ago too in New York. Right? Is this res, where is this restaurant? LA. California. I I think she was involved in a, a I well I I haven't thought about this in a long time but I she was involved with a milchik restaurant in uh in New York back in the 70s, you know. But but I'm not sure about that. So, um, yeah, a, a couple of interesting rabbit holes there. Thanks, Vanessa. I, the, uh, I I think there's a case to be made here. You know, there the the movie on one level sort of is making explicit this sort of connection between his mom, who was a frustrated artist, and the artist that he becomes. But I think uh, in a little less explicit way, he's also his father's son. Right. And his son, his dad says to him, finally, near the end, accepting what he's doing, he says, I know, I know you're going to work like hell, you know, something like that to, uh, to whatever it is you choose to do because you're a chip off the old block and, and movie making, perhaps more than uh, than the other forms of the arts. Right. Are this combination of sort of understanding highly technical things, you know, how cameras work. Uh, the, the use of the different angles, the use of the different kinds of equipment, you know, what sort of camera to use in, in a particular situation. I mean, those are all technical questions that you have to really understand a fair amount about science, you know. Uh, uh, so in that sense, he, he's got some of his father's kind of analytic brain um, and, uh, uh, and also his mom's artistry. Uh, and it is the the uh, one might argue the unique coming together of those two sensibilities in one person that is one of the things that makes Spielberg so good at what he does. Uh, I think the movie doesn't make that connection with his dad quite as explicit. Um, his his dad's story uh, appears at least in the movie to be one of a, a an you know ahead of his time always upward tra trajectory in the creation of the home computer, right? Uh, uh, and uh, that makes his story inherently a little less dramatic, right? Than the mom who uh, sublimated her artistic uh, uh, influ influences, you know, um, uh, to become a mother, right? And so giving up her career as a pianist um, and so on. This uh, says me, computer pioneer Arnold Spielberg. I mean, yeah. you know, I think he was famous in his own right. He yeah. just, you know, didn't yeah. know about him. So, and, and what is that? He, uh, there was a picture of him at 102, 
I I don't th- I don't think that's him because he died in ninety five. I think that's I, I don't I'll, 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 I'll um, let, me, let me take a quick look. Yeah. I don't think that's do that. oh baby. What what year is that? No, he died of cancer. Yeah. Yep. Is that smoking the type of cancer? I I can't pronounce the name, but it covers all the all the lung tissue and the chest tissue. Yeah. No, he he was a hundred and I guess this is him. Mm. No, that's got that's no. got to be. Uh, it's not him. Survivor, right? Yeah. Arnold. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah, it's a different Arnold Spielberg, I think. Exactly. Yeah. So. Uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, Elaine. Uh, yeah, could you comment on the scene where the the uh, cute little blonde Christian girl is trying to get him to come to Jesus? And um, is there something about if they get a Jewish person to come to Jesus, it gives them more status with the church or something like that? Well, I, I think the movie plays a little more for laughs than that. By the way, I think it's interesting that you remember her as being a blonde. Uh, I'm pretty sure she's a brunette. Uh, oh. But it's interesting <laughs> that that's the way you remember her. Uh, but, yeah, but she is a pretty young actress for sure. And uh, um, uh, I think uh, there, there's no question that in a, a certain brand of evangelical Christianity, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there there's a definite interest in uh, uh, converting Jews, and and yeah, you get you know points in heaven if you yes. uh, bring people to the good news, right, uh, of Christianity. Uh, the movie plays this a little more for laughs, I mean, because she is uh, a little more uh, what should we say? She's a little more libidinous than her uh, devotion should would allow right so she she has a crush on uh she has a crush on jesus and several other uh um you know uh movie actors i, th- I think it's funny that there's a picture of bob dylan among the pictures that are up on her wall actually in her bedroom i mean she's got you know other sort of teen uh yeah. teen idol types but she's also got a picture of bob dylan and probably doesn't realize that he's Jewish uh, at that point in time in 1964. You know, uh, the idea that his original name was Zimmerman was was probably not as well known as it is to us now. Uh, but anyway, that that's a little inside joke, maybe. Uh, but uh, um, I I think that the movie suggests that she's just curious. She you know uh, knows that. Uh, uh, Jesus was Jewish and kissing a Jewish boy is the next best thing. <laughs> right? But I, I, so I think it plays it a little more for laughs than maybe that situation really uh, uh, might have been, but, uh, but maybe not. I mean, that it's certainly, uh, uh, it, if nothing else, it may be the way Spielberg remembers it, that it's not so much that she was really, desperately trying to convert him in any way she can think of but that uh uh you know the idea that she was talking to him about jesus uh made it okay to also be kissing him you know okay so uh so i i i, I will say there there's a scene where his sister says uh something about when are you gonna make movies that have roles like this for girls in it you know, when is the girl going to save the day, right? And in some ways, this girl, uh, this, uh, you know, non-Jewish girlfriend uh, who encourages him to pick up the camera again. Remember, he hasn't picked up the camera since they moved from Arizona to California, um, saves the day. Okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an unsuccessful romance in the end, but it's highly successful in that it gets him to pick up the camera again. And uh, and and start being on his way to being a movie director once again. So uh, it's uh, uh, in that sense. I mean, th- these are some of the things when I say that this is a kind of an intricate text. These are these things that sort of come together like puzzle pieces in this movie. So the sister says, uh, 
you know, when are you going to have a role like that for a girl in your movie? And then this movie has a role like that for a girl who uh, who does that. Um, other kinds of details that get repeated and come back, you know, the sort of thing, uh, uh, this is just between us, right? It's, uh, which uh, a number of characters sort of say to him, at various times, right? Um, he shows that uh, movie uh, uh, to his mother, you know, the, where the camera has revealed. And here again, here's this theme of the camera reveals more than you expect it to reveal, right? Uh, reveals the uh, relationship between uh, his mother and Benny. Uh, and it's, I, I'll, I won't tell, you know, uh, this is between us, right? Uh, and uh, later on, I think his dad asked him to make the movie of the camping trip and says that's between us, right? Uh, and uh, it, at the end, after the, the, the scenes that take place, after showing the movie of Ditch Day, right? And he has the confrontation with the, uh, um, you know, the, the athletes that have been his tormentors out in the hallway, uh, says something about... Uh, it would be bad for you to tell anybody about this. This is between us. And he, he says, uh, th it, this is between us, unless I make a movie about it, which is kind of, a, you know, it it's, you know, this is the movie he made about it. Um, 1964 to 2022, 36, 58 years later, right? He uh, got around to making a movie about it and uh, revealing that. Um, so uh, the bagel man stuff kind of gets me to think of what's going on right now. Um, calling people names and whatever and making yeah. fun of his name. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sort of uh, everybody else just going along with it. Right. But they keep teasing him about bagel men and hang a bagel in the locker. That would never, I, I don't know. Of course we live in a Jewish suburb and so it's hard to tell in Arizona, how that would fly. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, confirmation class kids telling me about kids in Lake Forest uh, when they were playing hockey would throw pennies out onto mm -hmm. the, you know, when they were playing the Highland Park kids. Yeah, right? that happened to Ethan because he was from Schechter. Yeah. And oh. it was the Lake, again, the Lake Forest kids. <laughs> right. Yeah. So look, there are neighborhoods where this, for whatever reason, continues to per perpetuate. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and this was, you know, that that's before we, you know, we're in a moment now where we're concerned about anti-Semitism at the highest levels in, in, you know, the U.S. government and universities and things like that. When that stuff was happening to Ethan and other kids, you know, around his age, we were not thinking that this is a systemic, you know, all across the country problem. Um, but we're pretty shocked that it was happening even in a place like Lake Forest, you know, so. It goes, listen, it's been here for a long time. I worked for a guy who was a Lithuanian Jew and he went to high school. He used to fight his way to school every day. Yeah, yeah, you know. I, my, gr my grandson had to quit his hockey team because uh -huh. the kids were uh, making snide remarks about him being Jewish. Yeah, yeah. Where is that? Uh, Sue, River Forest. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the, so uh, you're right, Hubie. Certainly, these things have always been around. You know, there was a period of time when we more successfully uh, were able to say it's unacceptable, and uh, so, I mean, you know, to a certain extent, when uh, presidential candidates court the white supremacist vote it makes it okay to say things out loud that uh wasn't okay to say before um so even if people felt it they it it was it was probably better for us when it was more suppressed <laughs> um and certainly better for us when presidential candidates disavowed the uh, uh the endorsement of white supremacists right? So uh, it's hard to put that genie back into the bottle, as as we're seeing. Mm -hmm. So, um, but uh, but it's always been there, right? And uh, um, and 
you know, it's back in a, in a lot of uh, ugly and unpleasant ways. So yeah. I'm not entirely sure. You know, look, it, it depends on the, on the neighborhood, right? I'm hanging a ba bagel in somebody's locker and, and uh, calling them names probably wouldn't fly in the Highland Park anymore. Um, no. But in Oak Park, you know, it's happening right now. Mm -hmm. you know? So, um, so the, the this is is so I I think uh, you know is the movie realistic? I I think it's deliberately not exactly realistic, but but it's uh, uh, but it certainly depicts like a memory play. You know what uh, what our recollections are of childhood. You know what his recollections <laughs> are of his childhood, right? And uh, it it's. It becomes part of what, but he is at his most courageous behind a camera, right? I, I'm, you know, I, I'm. It, it's hard for him to talk to people directly. He does occasionally this movie, and when he does, he can be charming and funny. Um, but uh, he does his real talking with a camera, uh, and I think <clears throat> that's uh, 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 probably true to Spielberg's life in many ways, right? Um, you know, and no amount, uh, he also recognizes the power of it that no amount of talking about the Holocaust, uh, is as good as making Schindler's List. So, so, uh, so I, I think that makes it a very, uh, powerful, very interesting, uh, film in, in so many ways. Uh, so I would say this is one that's definitely on the, on the, you know, we talked about some of the movies we show in real Jewish classics. Uh, maybe not such classics, you know. Uh, some of them have the, the some redeeming features that we really like, um, uh, uh, you know. Uh, but but some of them are true, you know, classics when it comes to telling the story of Jews in America. And I would say this is one of them. Um, you know, a, a really uh, great and well done. Uh, and I can't tell you how much I'm in love with the style of it. Uh, just the uh, the use of the, uh, as I said, the, the camera taking pictures of filmmaking is, is really, uh, that alone is, is, you know, say worth the price of admission, you know, um, and, uh, the scene at the end when he goes in and, and gets a, a few minutes with, with, uh, you know, the, the camera pans around the office when he, and you see the actor, uh, by the way, the the just the 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 moments that the camera captures the eyes of the actors in this movie, uh, you know, extraordinary. The it's extraordinary acting, it's extraordinary camera work. But catching these moments of, for instance, ambivalence in the eyes of his mother, you know, um, the way she looks uh, uh, at, at his father and at Benny. I mean, the the you know, there's so much story and truth told through the eyes of the characters but in this scene at the end where uh, uh he's in the this office um you know and it dawns on him whose office he's in as the camera looks around and sees the movie posters and sees you know uh what are they uh you know the searchers and the quiet man and uh uh you know these great john ford uh, you know, not all of those movies hold up, I'd say, into the 21st century, but they are amazing to look at. I mean, they're amazing examples of the filmmaking craft, even when they're, uh, um, you know, they might fall a little off on the racist scale and the, uh, um, you know, and on, on a scale about uh, women and women's roles, you know, but, uh, and it comes all the way around. And then the last one, it shows us is, is the man who shot Liberty Valance, which of course is one of the movies that, you know, he watches with his Boy Scout friends and, uh, you know, has, has absorbed into his own filmmaking. So even if you have no idea who John Ford is, this movie still tells you how important John Ford is in the life of Steven Spielberg, right? Uh, it's a great piece of filmmaking. Uh, and I'd say a, a nice little microcosm of, of the, 
the the power and the detail that you see all through the movie. Uh, I talked a lot today. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I just want to tell you that the, that the camera can be very dangerous, and I, I have an experience yeah. when I was in the army. Uh, if we had a, an African general who was being taken around to various bases in the United States, and he's treated, you know, with great deference. And so I was on assignment with a uh, news reporter, also army, and we're in, we're in some sort of room and all of a sudden the the the, the uh, reporter tells me take a picture i didn't have any idea there's nothing going on as far as i was concerned but i always had my camera at the ready i clicked the picture and that was it and before i could do anything he grabs me back and he says we're out of here he takes me yeah. in he goes back to the lab he says i need those pictures now okay when i come out of the dark room there's mps waiting for me i says what <laughs> and it turned out what, he, what was going on is the this guy was this general, an African general, was trying coming to the United States. He wanted atomic weapons, and the yeah. army was desperately trying not to give him anything and not offend him. And so yeah. I'd taken a picture of him with one of our generals teaching him how to operate a nickel coin machine. Mm -hmm. And okay. luckily, I was only following orders, so nothing happened to me. But I think the other guy got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I and and the, the this movie shows us that right. Uh, the yeah. camera sees what it sees. It, it isn't always what we expected it to see, and you catch things, you know, uh, that in some cases you wish you hadn't, right? Um, so it's it's very interesting, and the whole movie is this kind of a magic box if you think about it. I mean, there's the scene, you know, where Spielberg, the director's camera is watching the the character of Spielberg making a movie right uh, i mean it, there's this kind of uh, circular circularity to that that is is intriguing and interesting and uh, a a kind of uh, it's kind of a puzzle right i mean what's uh, um you know who's the real spielberg in the in the movie Right, the the one behind the camera, or the one you know holding the camera. Uh, I mean, it's 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 very interesting. So, so, all right. Well, thank you very much, guys. It's good to see you. Thanks for thank faithful you. joining us. We've got one more in this go round a week from today. Next stop, Greenwich Village, which I'm pretty sure you have to find on YouTube. Right? Yeah, but I, I, yeah. I'm keeping. I'll let everybody know because I found one, but it's in Italian. It's <laughs> so let me see what I can do. All right. Okay. Great. It's got to be here. So I hope so. We, again, we we think we found it before we started this, but yeah, and it's yeah. Yeah. I looked and I only could find it on YouTube. Yeah. But you found it in English? Oh, I don't know. I didn't go that far. See? Okay. <laughs> Let us know. Let us know if it's in English. Yeah. Right. Do you have a copy of the DVD somewhere? I can try to track it down if people want to borrow it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, all right. Uh, see Hanukkah. everybody. And we'll see you next Thank week. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Great movie. Loved it.